Welcome to another week. I'm starting this one off rather early, trying to get a bunch of work done before I take my parents north to pick up their electric car, which they ordered maybe two months ago. It's a Chevy Bolt EUV, brand new, and with all the incentives through Green Mountain Power, the state of Vermont, the federal tax credits, GM, uh, they're going to pay about $15,000 to take it off the lot, which is absolutely incredible. And Green Mountain Power gives you a free level 2 charger, and GM pays for the installation of the charger. So it's crazy not to get a Chevy Bolt EUV at this point in time. So we're going to pick that up. I'm going to drive it home for them because they're afraid of the technology. They've never driven an electric car, so uh, actually I haven't either, but uh, I'm pretty sure I can figure it out pretty quickly. Anyway, that's what my day is going to look like, and then the rest of the day I'm going to be installing the level one charger, which comes with the car. So I've got to go to Home Depot when we get back and get a new um, circuit, a 20 amp circuit, and some new line, and uh, have uh, a separate circuit just for the level one charger so they can start charging right away. Anyway, it's going to be an interesting week. I'm dialing back the training a bit because I have the Mount Greylock race coming up next weekend and yeah, lots of house projects and lots of writing projects. I'm really uh, doing some good thinking of late. So I will keep you in the loop. Sitting in the educational bubble is kind of like lying in bed on a cold morning. You know you have to get up, but bed is so much nicer than not bed. And sitting in the toasty car and listening to a book is so much nicer than getting out of the car. <laughs> Almost done with Robert Sapolsky's book, Determined. Hmm a love-hate thing going with it. I don't know. I don't know. This book is going to cause me to do some really deep thinking about a lot of things. All right, it's time to get out. I'm getting ready to head outside for a physical adventure. I don't know exactly what it's going to be yet. Doesn't matter but I'm putting myself towards the door into my clothes or in reverse order, clothes first, hopefully. Anyway, I'm thinking about the book Determined by Robert Sapolsky and this idea that we don't have free will. So I want to take a look at it through the lens of what's happening right now. Am I willing myself out the door? Am I willing myself into my clothes? It feels that way. Although it's a very gentle, curious suggestion, like a parent might suggest something to a child, or uh, with my cats, I often make suggestions to my cats, hoping that they take the suggestion. They don't always do that. But I'm suggesting to my body being that I do something, and if it says, yeah, I don't have any resistance to that, well, then it's going to happen. So it looks like I am in conscious control, but really what happened is that me as an entity outside of my identity narrative, otherwise known as my will, didn't see a problem with the suggestion. But if we as an identity, as a will, ask our body being to do something that it's not interested in doing, we're going to discover that it stays put. And the moment that we discover that we are still staying put in our chair, our dorsolateral prefrontal cortex quickly comes online to make up a reason as to why this is what we actually want to do and that this is still our choice. So what we experience as 
free will is really a series of justifications and rationalizations for what we are discovering ourselves doing. So then you could ask, well, what's the point of this illusion? What's the point of this imagined me that really doesn't have any power to do anything? Well, I think this is where most people that discuss free will get it wrong. It's not that we as an organism don't have the ability to make a choice. We do. It's simply that the part of our mind, our conscious will or identity narrative, we believe ourselves to be, I'm in charge, it was never built to be the one that moves your body. So what is it built to do? It's built to simulate, it's built to imagine, it's built to test in the mind prior to taking action. Because in the way back, if you took action without thinking about it, you could die. So our brains now have this feature that allow us to run models with us as the central character given certain attributes that we would call our identity. This is who I am. This is what I'm good at. This is what I'm bad at. This is my rank in the social group. So these are the people that I can speak up to. These are the people that I can speak down to. These are my peers. And the result of these simulations gives us an output. And then our body being takes a look at that output and says, hmm, okay, that's useful. That's some good information. Now I will take a step. But when our identity believes that it's in charge, and there's a lot of messaging that we're bombarded with now that tells us that is the case, just be your true expression. Yeah, but you're not really a true expression. You're just a simulated narrative. So if we can recognize that this tool allows our greater being, our greater entity, whatever it is you want to call us as a larger context, if you can allow that your conscious identity space is simply a heads-up display for the rest of you and that it's the rest of you that's making the decision and taking the step, then suddenly we don't need to be talking about free will anymore because the entire conversation is premised on the belief that we as a simulated identity narrative have control over our body, and we don't. Not really. Not when it matters. So, if you can allow that Tim, as a complete being, does make decisions, and if you can also allow that Tim, as an identity with a life history and a story and an imagined future and a past that I'm trying to escape from or transform, and if you can allow that this is simply a tool for the rest of you, then we don't need to talk about free will anymore. So it's not that you don't have it, it's just that you don't consciously have it. But it's still you making the decisions. But not the you that you know. It's the you that you don't. It's the you that you need to get to know because it's the one that really ultimately matters. All right, I'm off to move. It's November 1st, and it's snowing. It is time to go play in the snow. I'm out doing a boot slog with poles on the town line trail in Woodford, Vermont, and it's a grind. Boot slogs are tough, and I'm doing a hill bound uh, with the poles, so it's a lot like classic skiing with these big heavy weights on my feet, and it's good. Uh, it's so much more exhausting than just running. Uh, I'm going to try to do this more and more as the winter progresses. I'm going to incorporate running and boot slogs into my training, but with poles. And as I'm going along, I'm thinking about the book that I'm going to finish in the next five minutes, Determined by Robert Sapolsky. And as I'm cranking along, I'm thinking about all the options I had today and all the choices I could have made and all the people around me that don't do what I do, the environment that I'm in, it doesn't support this. And so much of what he's saying is right on the mark, 
and I'm in full agreement, but there's so much he's missing, really important components that he's missing in this book. That essentially we can function as an identity, and if we do, there is no free will. But if we step outside of identity, then it's not that we're making decisions in any particular moment. It's that we're setting ourselves up, we're priming ourselves for future moments where different decisions will be made, like this. My environment doesn't support this. My biology doesn't support this. My neurochemistry doesn't support this. My familial structure and the peer group that I hang out with doesn't support this. So how is it possible? According to him, it's not. According to him, I can't do this. This would never be something that I choose as an identity. But if I can slowly change the environment that I'm in, and when I say change the environment, I don't mean move to a different place. I mean create an environment that causes decisions like this to be the easiest ones to make, or at least as easy as any other decision. So rather than coping, this becomes a really good option, but only because I've set up a structure in my life and I've constrained my being, my identity, in such a way that this becomes a possibility, a strong contender. In fact, I've done such a good job of constraining my environment that I do stuff like this all the time, throughout the day, every day. And when I'm done, I'm going to go into the house and I'm going to dig in the frozen ground with a little gardening trowel and then scratch the dirt into a big pile with my hands and then drag it backwards on my hands and knees in a bucket that I eventually pull out of the hole, lift up and throw onto a, a huge pile that I have to lift about six feet in the air to get to. Now, does that mean I'm tough? No. Does that mean I have willpower? No. Does that mean I can will myself to do difficult things? No. It just means that in advance of the activity, I have slowly, over time, created structures, created environmental cues, and created ways of thinking and ways of being that are not related to identity. And it looks like I have a lot of free will. It looks like I'm making really hard choices in the moment. But I'm never making a hard choice in the moment because you can't. I'm making a really easy choice that has been set up in advance by me as a being outside of identity, knowing what my identity is likely to face and what my body is likely to face in the future and which directions it is likely to be pushed in. Coping. Depression. So instead, I set myself up to succeed. Now, can I take full credit for everything that I do? Absolutely not. But can I take some of the credit? Yeah, but not as an identity that's proud, but simply as someone that understands that process matters. And the will and this whole conversation around free will is not about process, it's about results, it's about outcomes, it's about me conquering something. That's not what I'm doing here. I'm concurring with something. I'm agreeing with something. I'm flowing with something. That's what concur means, to flow together. That's what I'm doing out here. I'm flowing with the environment. I'm flowing with my body. I'm flowing with my nose right now. So, I don't know how I feel about his book. There's a lot of really great information in there, but he leaves you hanging. He leaves you with no place to go, and it's very preachy and judgmental, all while telling you that you shouldn't be preachy and judgmental. He's confused, because I don't think he's really spent that much time outside of his identity. I don't think he's spent that much time as an observer without a story. Yeah, I learned a lot from the book, but I think he could learn a lot from Buddhism, perhaps? I don't know. Waiting for my family to pick me up at the mill. Gonna take them north to pick up the electric car. 
didn't come in on Monday. They told us it was going to be there, but that was a false alarm. So heading up now, it's 25 degrees still. It's warmed up a little bit, but the roads could be icy. Hour and a half drive north. And uh, I'm going to drive the car home for them because uh, they don't yet trust themselves driving a new technology and I don't trust them either driving it. So I get to drive my first electric car. So this is the new electric car my parents are getting. <laughs> Not. <laughs> I'm hanging out in front of the old first church on my first classic roller ski since the 1980s. First time I've classic skied of any kind since the mid 90s. But classic roller skis, 1987, 88 maybe. Anyway, there's a race up Mount Greylock in Massachusetts this Sunday. Today is Thursday. I entered the race. I thought, I should probably try it a couple times, so I got a pair of training classic roller skis. These things are so heavy and slow, but uh, I'm going to race up Mount Greylock in three days. Anyway, the moment I put them on, I was so awkward, I fell within 30 seconds in the parking lot. I crashed, and I was like, oh no, that's it. I got to <laughs> contact the race organizer and get my money back. And then I went out skiing, and I just couldn't do it. I couldn't stride. I forgot how, I was so clumsy. But I've been out here for maybe 40 minutes now and I'm flying up hills like they're not even there. Hills that are really, really hard to skate up and I'm flying up without even getting my heart rate up. And this is why I jumped into this race because the way that I use the elliptical machine, I lean forward and I push way out the back and the Bigfoot light I do on the treadmill, I lean forward, hold on to the instrument panel and push way out the back with a long stride. I was curious, how well is that going to translate into classic skiing? I don't know. Maybe I'm more fit for classic than I am for skating. So now after flying up two really steep hills, not out of breath, I'm even more curious. I'm starting to get used to the, the stride and the stability and how to find my kick. I'll do another ski tomorrow and hopefully I get a little bit more stable, but uh, yeah, it's exciting. And I could be totally delusional. I could, uh, I could have zero technique and not even know it yet until I'm next to somebody with good technique. Again, I haven't done this since the mid nineties and roller skis are not ski skis. It's very different. Uh, anyway, interesting experiment. On Thursday nights at the mill, my buddy Ron, who has the studio beneath me, invites people over and they play music. And I get to listen to it through my floor, which is kind of fun. And every now and then I go hang out with them and just listen while they jam. <laughs> it is a very chilly November morning and I'm watching the sun rise over the mountain and listening to the book Your Future Self and right now he's discussing the idea that we are not one single identity throughout time, but we are a multiplicity. We have multiple selves, much like a startup where you have many people, founders, uh, getting something off the ground, each doing uh, a certain thing, providing a certain skill set. And I'm very much in agreement with this view that we are a multiplicity and the moment you begin to allow that to be the case, things start to change and you don't fight yourselves anymore. Just dropped my car off at the tire shop and I'm walking back to the mill and saw this beautiful Japanese maple. So pretty. The race I'm doing on Sunday, the Mount Greylock roller ski race, 
eight miles long, climbs over 2,200 feet. Classic roller skiing, which is a technique that I have never done. I thought yesterday that I had last classic roller skied in 1986, but that was wrong. Because in 1986, there was no classic skiing. There was only skating. Classic skiing had vanished. It wasn't yet called classic skiing. It was originally called cross country skiing using a diagonal stride. And then Bill Koch changed the world in the early eighties, bringing skating onto the scene. He won the world cup. Uh, Bill Koch was one of my inspirations as a kid because he lived just over the hill. Anyway. So in 86, we were only skating. So the roller skiing that I did after my senior year in high school and maybe two years at Middlebury was just skating. So up until yesterday, I've never been on classic roller skis. Yesterday was the first time ever, and it was so awkward. Anyway, why would I do this? Why would I be putting myself in an eight mile roller ski race up a mountain using a technique and equipment that I have never ever touched in my life, just a couple days out. Well, number one, because I have an identity that isn't grounded in reality. My identity believes in all kinds of magical things, which is why identities are so dangerous. And you'll hear me counseling all the time to step out of your identity because it's gonna get you in trouble. And in this case, I'm using my identity. I'm using it to put myself in a situation that's going to force learning, that's going to force growth, that's going to humble me, that's going to give me data about the reality of my technique and conditioning related to classic skiing. And I've got some experience on snow, so I have okay technique on classic snow skis, but I haven't done that since the 90s. Anyway, Classic roller skis, totally different animal. But I'm gonna collect data in the race, and then I'm gonna use that data to create a process so that possibly at some point I become a really phenomenal classic skier. Uh, and the reason they call it classic, by the way, is because a lot of Scandinavians complained that this American Bill Koch had ruined their sport with skating, and they wanted the original skiing to come back. So everybody got together and they said, yeah, maybe we'll have two disciplines, different races with the different techniques. So now you have classic, uh, the original technique and skating, which we now call freestyle, meaning you can use any technique you want, but everybody skates because it's faster. Uh, anyway, so this race is gonna be massive data collection. So right now I've got to build a pair of classic poles because the only ski poles I have are for skating. Skate poles are much longer than classic poles. And yesterday, trying to classic ski on the roller skis with skate poles was awful. So, gotta build a pair right now. I'm making a set of poles that I can use in the race on Sunday. So I microwaved some water to undo the baskets and also take the handles off. I've already taken those off. Uh, these poles were my skating poles back at Middlebury in the late 80s. Uh, and uh, I'm going to turn them into classic poles right now. All right, let's see if that's enough. Basket came off pretty easily, so now it's just a shaft that I need to cut down to size for classic skiing and then put some roller skiing baskets on here with a glue gun, and we're good to go. I'm just finishing up my third ever classic roller ski. So this is a gigantically heavy classic roller ski, huge wheels that don't roll backwards. There's a ratchet so they can only go forward. Um, longer, heavier versus a skate ski, which is much lighter, thinner wheels, uh, shorter, and moves a lot faster than a classic ski. Uh, and classic poles are shorter, so I took my poles from the 1980s, uh, which I raced on at Middlebury, probably my sophomore year, 1988 at the Junior Olympics. Uh, and I put some modern grips on them, some modern roller ski tips, and, and we're ready to go there. And it's interesting because the first time it was so awkward, I thought I've got to ask for my money back in the race because I just couldn't do it. It's, it's impossible. There's no way. I was delusional to think I could.
classic roller ski in a race. But yesterday I started to feel better. I was playing around with technique, getting my hips underneath me more, driving my knee forward. And then today I went up one of the steepest hills here in town. It's a 10 to 13%. I was classic skiing up the hill with less effort, less tired than if I skated it at a speed that would have won the white face race on gigantically heavy old roller ski. So again, I have no idea what's gonna happen tomorrow. I could get my doors absolutely blown off and I should because I'm 55 and I've classic skied on roller skis three times. But part of me thinks the elliptical, the Bigfoot light on the treadmill, it's the same muscles. Those muscles are solid in me and I've got hundreds and hundreds of hours in those activities. Uh, it's just really the technique. And if I can dial it in during the race, I don't know, we'll see. I could get last place. That's a distinct possibility. But I could also maybe be in the top 15 again, like I was at Whiteface. I don't know. I'm curious to find out. Um, it'd be nice if I had lighter skis because everybody else is going to be on racing skis. These are dog trainer skis that cost next to nothing because I didn't want to invest a lot of money in it if I wasn't going to do it much. Um, so, I don't know. We'll see. I just got home and found that the kitties left me a gift. But it's not a mouse. That's a rat. First rat I've ever seen here. Hmm. It's Sunday morning and I'm about to head off to Lanesboro, Massachusetts to compete in the Mount Greylock Hill Climb roller ski race. And I just got an email saying that the snow and ice is now cleared off the top of the course. So we are gonna ski to the summit. Uh, and they also told us there is one downhill, even though we're climbing a mountain, there is one downhill that's very twisty and one should use caution. This is gonna be fun. Anyway, here we go. Just did a warm up running up the mountain with one of my old skiers, Tim White, uh, who's now got 46, 47, one of my kids. Anyway, um, he's telling me about the downhill at nine kilometers. And he said, it's fast, it's curvy, and it's sketchy. And now I'm like, oh crap. <laughs> I barely have any experience going downhill on classic skis and it's different. They're more wobbly than skate skis. Um, all right, anyway, I, I don't know what to do. Good luck, guys. Have fun. Three, two, one, go! I couldn't be more thrilled to bring together such a strong showing here in the Berkshires with clubs represented from every eastern state this year. Uh, we also had a record number of masters out here today, over 25. Let's give it up for the masters. Valley School, Tabor Greenberg. <laughs> Bib number one, winning the open men's race, Remy Drolet. Moving on to our masters, the 
gonna might have to recognize the clubs once I talk to a couple of these folks, just so I don't make any mistakes. But in third place, Chris Burnham. A lot of people are fighting over him for club participation. He's racing with Northwest Vermont. Nice job, Chris. Second place. This is pretty exciting in the Masters here today. Second place from Prospect Mountain Ski Club, Tim Van Orden. That was a brutal race. Oh my God. Eight miles going up a mountain using a technique that I have never used on roller skis except for the three days prior to this race. And it was just, ha. Huh. Uh, I totally lost coordination towards the end. I slowed down a lot. Ended up getting second for Masters. But the man that got third today for the Masters, Chris Burnham, he was maybe 45 seconds behind me. He got second place at the American Berkebeiner two years ago in the Classic race. Last year, I think he might have been 10th in the Classic race. So he's one of the best Classic skiers in the country, and he started in my wave, but there was another guy uh, who had wicked fast skis, and he went out like a rocket, and Chris tried to stay with him and couldn't, and I just watched the two of them getting away. Uh, and then eventually I caught up to Chris because he kind of burned himself out trying to stay with this guy. And uh, as I caught up to him, I said, who is that? He said, I don't know, but his skis are just way too fast. And then we got to some flat sections where you double pole and that guy was just gone. Uh, and then there was a downhill that was probably a kilometer long. And when we finished the downhill, we couldn't even see him on the long climb ahead. He was already minutes ahead of us due to the speed of his skis. The guy's in shape, no doubt. He's definitely super fit. But his skis were much, much faster than is recommended for a roller ski race. So, um, really, it was a race between me and Chris Burnham for the Masters. He and I duped it out in the Jackson, New Hampshire race. I forget the name of the race. The Long Haul Loppet last year, which had like a 1500 foot climb in it and he and I duked it out all the way up that climb so to be with him in a classic race and come out ahead of him pretty exciting so my elliptical my bigfoot light and my skating and pulling machine which gave me arm strength uh, got me through this race but hamstrings classic uses hamstrings in a way that I have never experienced before. My hamstrings are so shot. I'm not going to be able to walk for days. Uh, skating does not use your hamstrings like that. So um, anyway, really good experiment. I ended up winning the Masters Hill Climb Season Challenge. Best two out of three hill climb races for Masters. So I won white face, got second today. So um, I'm the... New England Masters Hill Climb champion for the 2023 season. Anyway, good race, good people. Uh, a lot of really extraordinary athletes here today. Remy Drolet, whose technique I'm in love with after I filmed him at the Williams Carnival last year. He's a Canadian Olympian. He's the NCAA champion. He destroyed the field today. Uh, I wish I could have watched him in the race. Anyway, uh, I'm going to head home and ice my legs maybe I don't know uh, I couldn't even bend over to take my roller skis off when I finished my hamstrings are just destroyed all right I'm off here we are at the end of another week in the training world this is what they might call a taper week so you drop your training down gradually uh, in preparation for a race but I still got 17 hours of training this week for most people, that would be a gigantic volume <laughs> for a week. But for me, no, that's a taper. Uh, I could have done less, but the race really wasn't that important to me. It was just an experiment. I was just curious. Can I classic roller ski? And how well does elliptical and Bigfoot light translate? Pretty well. It's not perfect, but considering I got on the podium for Masters, that's uh, a successful experiment. Okay, let me show you what I did in the world of strength training. On Monday, I did some squats on my tiptoes, which I really like, and I'm hoping that I start doing more of those. 
dips with 20 pound weight vest, feeling really comfortable. Deep push-ups, love those. And three sets of decent pulling. On Tuesday, I did neutral pull-ups, some warm-up sets, and then 38 pound uh, belt hanging from my waist, followed by an immediate six. And then, I don't know, I did 10, and then the 38 pound weight vest, followed by six and repeated that a few more times. I like that, doing a set without the weight belt immediately after, uh, feeling strong there. Wednesday, lots of knees to bar, pulling 20 minutes at the easiest level. More tiptoe squats on Thursday and two sets of pulling at the easiest level. Friday, just super easy dips. Yesterday, 10 minutes at the easiest level of polling. Again, just keeping the muscles moving. And then a few minutes ago, I finished 20 minutes at a decent weight on the polling machine. Didn't get enough in the race. I wanted to do some more, so that felt good. I thought my hamstrings were gonna be a complete disaster, but I did some massage and a few workouts after the race and they kind of loosened up, so they feel fine right now. I don't know what they'll feel like tomorrow or the day after, but right now I feel good. So <laughs> heading forward into the new week, I'm gonna try to get my volume back up over 21 hours, so three hours a day plus. I'm gonna do some more intensity on the polling machine. Maybe try to get some harder sets, five minute hard sets or eight minute hard sets. So I'm gonna see if I can get myself to do that. If I can't, that's fine because I'm getting stronger just doing my gentle approach. So uh, I'm gonna go to bed. It's been a long day and I'll see you in the next one.